how did people think uh, that the Enlightenment would come to an end? Uh, possibly by you know, the great, you know, the boot stamping on a human face forever, but in fact, it, it comes softly, gently, slowly, uh, almost kindly. And then after 20 or 30 years of it, uh, there is no real freedom of speech of it. Today's guest is no stranger to our series, uh, Peter Hitchens, a good friend, a regular col columnist for the Mail on Sunday. He's had a distinguished career as a journalist and foreign correspondent in Moscow and in Washington, amongst other places. He's contributed to The Spectator, The American Conservative, The Guardian and First Things. Peter also makes regular appearances on British television. He's been on Australian television. Uh, he's been, uh, he's a popular podcaster, as well as being one of the very few well-known journalists and public commentators who scrutinised and critiqued the COVID policies pursued in Britain. Peter has also been vocal in the whole narrative around the current war in Ukraine. He's written many books. He's just completed his most recent on the decline of education in Great Britain. Peter, it's terrific to see you again in your home town, in fact, here in Oxford. Good to see you too. Now, you lived and worked in Russia for a long time. Not a long time. I mean, it felt like a long time because it was uh, living in the Soviet Union takes more out of you or took more out of you than living in a normal country. I was there for two and a half years, but they were two and a half very intense years, the very end of the communist regime and the beginning of whatever it was that followed. So I often say that it was two and a half years, but it felt like five. So tell us a bit, it's really important for us in the West, I think, to understand what Moscow was like when everything changed. You know, you had President Reagan tear down that wall, a lot followed, the West thought, well, that's the end of autocracy, we're on the road to freedom, it's one out, end of history. What was the spirit like in Moscow? You were actually there in 1991. I was, uh, yeah. by extraordinary stroke of good fortune, I was one of the few Western correspondents who was actually present in the city when the, the August 1991 putsch, uh, basically run by old KGB and Communist Party heavies, uh, both took place and failed. And the day that it failed, and it was clear that it failed, uh, I remember driving around Moscow, uh, stopping quite a lot to see what was going on. And my, my most pungent memory is, in more ways than one, is that all the, the trash cans in central Moscow, which was a grey metal urn-shaped, were full of red Communist Party membership cards on fire. The Partini billets, as they call it, red and gold. And they, they, that was everywhere. The people had just thrown them away. It was a recognition. You no longer had to pretend to any loyalty to the Communist Party of the Soviet Union uh, for the sake of your career, for the sake of your children, for the sake of everything. That was the moment of death of communism as a force. And that very much struck me. There was a completely different atmosphere in the place from than the one that I was used to as well. I felt so liberated that I was actually singing hymns at the top of my voice as I drove around, ignoring the corrupt traffic police as I did so. I wish I'd been there. Well, to you, listen to you, I, you, you, you should wish you'd been there. It was a very exhilarating moment. And it was, what was also interesting and it, it became more and more significant, this wasn't just a sudden moment that had been partly under the leadership of Boris Yeltsin, a great failure of history, uh, a movement for the introduction of democracy and a great attack on corruption in uh, in in Russia, particularly, it was it was largely Russian and not so much outside the Russian part of the Soviet Union. So there's a strong support for the introduction of democracy, and in there were very few casualties of the of the, the August Putsch. I think two or three people killed, more or less, as a result of a hideous accident on the ring road quite near the American embassy. And a big ceremonial sort of funeral procession was held for them down the main western road out of the center of Moscow. And it was a democratic demonstration. People, what people were saying is we want freedom and we want democracy. And it, it all seemed perfectly possible at the time as well. You think they really it, was, it was very, very possible that here was this country which could rejoin the, the comity of civilized nations, which it had left after a very brief period of liberation in 1917. And people forget that there were two revolutions in 1917 yes. in Russia. 
uh, they think there's only one. The first one was, a, was in fact a liberal democratic revolution and it ended with the election. An amazing achievement you know, under universal suffrage for the first time of a constituent assembly in wartime. Uh, a very, very powerful uh, expression of Russian democratic will, which was immediately quashed by the Bolsheviks on the point of bayonet. And from then on, from, from the point of the Bolshevik putsch of, of 1917 up to the, the renewed attempt at the Bolshevik putsch of August 1991, Russia had been outside the Committee of Civilized Nations, and here was a chance for it to come back. So there would have been very little memory 70 years on. You'd had 70 years of almost a sort of stripping out of the soul in some ways, but people are excited about democracy. How, well, what do you think they thought well, democracy well, was? Well, I don't, I don't, what, what it, this is, the, the, I make the distinction partly because what happened in the rest of the Soviet Union tended to be a, a, a nationalist uh, outpouring, whether you were in Georgia or Ukraine or the Baltic republics or anywhere of, the, of that nature. It, what, what was going on was a sudden feeling, we're now at last liberated from the empire which the Soviet Union had been. In Russia, that wasn't their problem. In Russia, they were liberated from Bolshevism, and that was a wholly different and distinct thing, which people again forget. It's one of the reasons why the development of Ukraine and Russia has been so different in the, in the following years. So it turned out to be, for the average Russian, as I understand it, a, a, a less than happy experience, those few years of democracy. It wasn't as we experienced democracy. Well, what went the, the long the long struggle for freedom and and uh, the rule of law in this country was not always without difficulty. I think what went fundamentally wrong was I think the, the Western powers had an opportunity here to help uh, an, an event as great as the destruction of Hitler's Germany had taken place, only without a war. But in fact, the Soviet Union at the end of the of the of the the Bolshevik period was in, in something approaching ruins. Economically, it was yeah. a catastrophe. Nothing really worked. Uh, it, there, was a, there was a lot of squalor. There was nothing resembling the rule of law. There was already a very, very high level of corruption. A lot of the what we now see as the oligarchs and the corruption of modern Russia had its roots in the Communist Party of the Soviet Union and its, and its apparatus. Many people who later became uh, very powerful and very rich were people who came out of the Communist Party. And the, the, there was an opportunity for a reform and a, and, a, and a reconstruction on the same scale as was achieved by the occupying powers in Germany in 1945. But, but it was not that. taken. I wanted to ask you about that because I've often said when people want to criticise the Americans, it's a favourite sport in the West, it's in, in my country, that we forget that in contrast to what happened after the First World War, mm. the Americans, as by then, you know, the, the leading power on earth, after the Second World War, did two astonishing things. The Enlightenment approach that MacArthur took into Japan saw that country become a democratic ally, a reliable global citizen. And the Marshall Plan, at vast expense to yeah. the Americans, at a time when they were still horrendously indebted after the Second World War. They found 13 billion in, that, in the money of that time for a very carefully constructed Marshall Plan. Well, it was extraordinary event, and, and one which you know, people keep saying there should have been a Marshall Plan, then people say, well, yes, but it, it, the Marshall Plan wasn't as good as we say it wasn't. But actually, uh, it was an example of how generosity and long-sighted uh, thoughtfulness uh, can actually save and enhance civilization. And it was an example we should have followed in 1991 and didn't. Instead, we, we opened Russia to gangster capitalism and we imposed upon them the outward forms of democracy without any of its proper content. No effort was made to introduce the rule of law, adversarial politics, uh, or, or, or anything remotely approaching a powerful free press or media. Uh, there, was, there were elections, uh, which almost from the beginning began to be rigged. Uh, and at the same time, people were just finding all the, the, the things which they'd relied upon under the Soviet system, uh, which had given them something approaching a form of security at a very low level, swept away and replaced by nothing. You've seen the film The Third Man, the, 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 the great, um, the, the great uh, uh, Orson Welles movie, which begins with, with people in, in post-war Austria standing by the, the side of the road selling their possessions for food. 
I'd seen that film I probably about five or six times before I went to live in Moscow. But what astonished me when I was actually living in Moscow was I then saw middle-class professional people standing by the side of the road with little uh, little formica-topped tables selling their possessions for food. That's what people were reduced to, people like you and me. Not no, this is this is not improvident people, not people who are not been educated or prepared for life or haven't worked hard at their jobs, but normal, hardworking, responsible middle class citizens having to sell their possessions so they could buy bread. That happened. Oh, I believe that. And so and it was a very I promise you, I saw it, and yeah. it's very, very shocking to see, especially if you have enough imagination to realise that this could be you. Uh, as Konstantin Kissin put it, um, and of course he, you know, is Russian. Uh, all of a sudden, as you as you as you've said, some degree of security might have, might have been a grey life, but there was some degree of security. Oh, all yeah. of a sudden, you're having to sell your household possessions to try and get some bread, yeah. and you're seeing your daughter being lured towards something dreadful and modern day slave trade almost, and your yeah. sons losing their jobs. So and your pension dwindling to non-existence, or if it if it does exist, not being paid, and your bank account. Mm -hmm. Uh, being re reduced to, to joke money in a matter of days, everything you used to go on. And you associate this uh, with the new, uh, the, this arrival of, of so-called democracy, which is, a, which is why in, in the mouths of many Russians, uh, democracy has become a sweat word. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so, as you, you know, you've, you've, you've been very critical of anti-Russian prejudice in the West. It's again to go back to Japan and America. I know in Australia for a long time, you know, those who'd served in the in the Japanese theatre found it very, very hard to forgive the Japanese. Of there was a lot did, of yeah. prejudice. Of course they did. But there was leadership, including in Australia. The leader of my own party, a uh, predecessor of mine, was the one who in the mid-50s opened up a trade negotiation with Japan. Conscious as he was that many of his most loyal supporters were deeply concerned about this, but he rose above that prejudice. And as I understand it, part of what you're saying is that the West, rather smugly, allowed itself just to say, oh, they're terrible people. We're, we're so thankful they'd been beaten and then sort of walked away. There was a, yeah, there was a, also at the time all kinds of ideas of fashion were in the West. Mm -hmm. uh, the the, the sort of Milton Friedman ideas of, of, of letting everything rip economically is the best the best way of, of building a healthy economy, which in it, it may in some cases be true. I personally doubt it. But it couldn't have been more untrue in Russia. It just <laughs> say what you like about China and, and no doubt I will later on. Uh, there are quite a lot of the goods that we buy in our lives are made in China. Does, does anybody ever buy anything made in Russia? Uh, we we devastated what was what was left of, of their economy. And, and it, it, it just became nothing but an extractive economy producing oil and gas for, and, and some weapons. And, and that was about it. After, after, after we, it. It's not as if Russians cannot actually manufacture things. If you go back to the, the period before 1914 when French investment particularly was pouring into Russia, it was a very successful economy. Uh, but it, it, there, were, there was no opportunity given for it to rebuild itself as an economy or a society. Both those things were, were not just neglected, but were treated in ways which were, I don't I think they were intended to result in the catastrophe which followed, but it, it wasn't entirely unpredictable. Well, it was just so different to the attitude that was adopted after the Second World War. Totally That's different. what jumps out to totally me. Totally different. Here's, there's another contrast, which I, I have to stress because it always seems so important to me. In 1989, you'll remember that in, in the former East Germany, there were huge popular demonstrations of German East Germans demanding freedom, Leipzig particularly mm. in Dresden. At almost exactly the same time, there were huge popular demonstrations in yes. Peking uh, demanding the same thing. Yes. The Chinese state murdered the demonstrators and suppressed uh, any tendency towards freedom and democracy. Uh, the Soviet Union actually gave way. Uh, no, the, the, the collapse of the USSR is by no means totally bloodless. I was witness in, in Vilnius in 1991 to a particularly revolting attempt to crush a uh, protest. And there was the horrible incident, for instance, in, in Tbilisi, in Georgia, where, where, where soldiers killed people from the crowd with sharpened shovels. But it was uh, more or less, uh, I should say, 95% a non-violent retreat. We rewarded the, the, the Russians and the former, the, the former Soviet Union for giving way quite properly to democratic protest. Uh, by endless uh, hostility and contempt, 
And we rewarded the Chinese for murdering their own democratic protesters with friendship, trade, alliances, and frankly, bootlicking. And it's the most ex astonishing contrast. And I don't know how people can look themselves in the face who are responsible for it and, and explain why it is that we directly rewarded uh, a, a, a bloodthirsty and ruthless uh, police state and have treated a, a, a country which for all its faults gave way to democratic protest as a pariah. Um, I think I, I, I identify closely with what you're saying and yet it in no sense lessens my horror at what's actually unfolding. It's not to say that in any way what is happening is admirable. It's just to try and background and understand and say so we've got to learn from these mistakes. Well, I've always disagreed with the 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 the, 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 the old sword to comment to pardon. It's not it's not to, to understand everything is not to forgive everything. Mm. Uh, but I think it is necessary to understand things. Yeah. And if you and, and the context in which they happen, and if what you're talking about is the is, is the invasion of Ukraine, which I assume you are, uh, you you'll find that uh, even such a figure as Robert Kagan one of the most prominent neoconservatives uh, who's actually married to Victoria Newland, who's pursued in the State Department what I regard as a, as a strongly anti-Russian policy, has written in foreign affairs in the current issue, I think, which is it's quite plain that disgusting and obscene though the invasion was, uh, there was a, there was an element of provocation by the West. And if Robert Kagan can say that, then uh, frankly, so can I. And neither of us uh, should there, therefore be accused of defending the invasion or thinking that it was... It was uh, a civilized or lawful or, or even a um, remotely acceptable thing to do. But you have to understand the conditions under which it took place. It seems worth remembering that at the time uh, Michael, uh, Gorb Mikhail Gorbachev was greeted as a, a hero and a great friend in the West and is despised in China. Well, he's despised in Russia as well. Um, he's, he's largely associated in people's minds with the end of security and, yeah. and also uh, for weakness. And it's, it's, it's much as if Margaret Thatcher, for instance, is much less popular in Britain than she is outside it. It's often people who are highly regarded by other countries and not highly regarded in their own. But no, Gorbachev is, um, is, is, is still much loathed in, in Russia. I, I say partly because he, he's associated with the end of what, the, what is falsely called the golden time of Zoe Volemia uh, that had to come to an end here, but also because he's, he's seen as weak. Another thing that just uh, as a subset of all of this that strikes me as potentially interesting is the reunification of Germany. So you saw West Germany invest massively. Oh, co co colossally. West Germans had to pay for it too. Yeah. With huge solidarity taxes were necessary to pay for the, the, this transformation. Hypothetical, I know then, but what do you think the West might have done better after 1991 in Russia? What could they... Any thoughts on what they could have done better? Well, first of all, a completely done? different economic program. Uh, not not, not the, the, the wild release of, of market economics into, into, a, into a Soviet system, but a serious attempt to in, in invest. Something, uh, similar things, I suppose, have happened in, in parts of Eastern Europe, where you know, the countries such as the, the, the Czech Republic, which have uh, very highly educated and, and, and skilled workforces, have, 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 have now got strong functioning industries thanks to foreign investment. That could have happened. Uh, the, uh, but also what was needed, as I say, was, was much, much more of a directed program to try and create a functioning civil society. I said that I've come to the conclusion after all my travels that the, the key things for, for a society to work properly are the rule of law and, and the, the liberties of speech, thought and assembly. Those two things combined will create a society in which you can actually have a functioning civilization. Uh, you then build, that's the substructure, you can then build onto that the superstructures, things which I value very highly, so adversarial parliaments. Uh, a, 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 a genuine proper diversity of political parties which enables government to alternate uh, and the the, the the willingness of of, of the media to criticize uh, government quite strongly and, and, and act as a, a fourth state uh, these things happen but that's what we should have been aiming for and a lot of this was very much uh, done in occupied Germany after 1945 yes. As uh, specifically, yeah. people thought that how do we make sure that what that we that the Germany which results from this is a better country 
than the one which we've just destroyed. Well, and, they, and, they, and they succeeded. It's, it's, it, it, you, the people say, well, um, the, the, the nation building is, 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 is often folly, and it often is. But in a ground zero moment, such as you had in, in Germany in '45, and as you had in, in Russia in 1991, it was possible, should have been done. And Japan. As you say. Mm. So uh, you yourself have often reminded leaders of the old saying that the first casualty in war is truth. Mm -hmm. uh, you've covered a lot of uh, wars um, yourself as a, as a correspondent over the years. Uh, Only by accident. <laughs> well, I'll never, no, but you've done never voluntarily go into a war zone. Um, okay. no, I once blundered in Somalia, uh, which was my worst mistake. Um, but I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not really a war correspondent. I have been in places where I've suddenly found and myself listening to the sound of gunfire a good deal closer than I want it to be. But I, if, if anybody said, well, do you want to go and cover this war? I say, no, 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 I'd rather be made gardening correspondent than cover a war. Thank you very much. But I was just intrigued because you've been there with the design by accident. Um, what, do you, what do you make of the Western media coverage uh, of, of the conflict in Ukraine? Uh, it, it seems to me to be very important because uh, Maybe there's a lack of understanding of Russia without, in any sense, condoning what's happening, but an understanding of the background. The other thing that seems missing to me is that, you know, there's some aspects of Ukraine that were pretty troubling, I've got to say. Well, these things are true. I mean, there's no, there's, there's no context or background, but it is, it is the case in most serious discussions in modern Western countries that knowing anything about the subject is a positive disadvantage. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, here I am. I've, yeah. I've been to Ukraine. I reported from Ukraine on the problems of that country, and particularly the difficulty over the the, the Russian-speaking minority. Gosh, ten years ago, uh, I was in Ukraine before. I'm familiar with Crimea. I, I know what goes on there. I, I was, you know, was was going down there in the 1990s. I took holidays in the Crimea in the 1990s. We can say I have some uh, idea of the, of the the nature of the crisis. I could give you, if you had time, a history of the of, of the actual attempts by Crimea to get out of Ukraine back in 1992, which is fascinating. I, I'm not, I don't claim to be an expert of Ukraine, but I find that introducing these things into any discussion of it just causes trouble because people think, well, are you just making life difficult? Can't you just see this is this is the evil invasion of a, of a sovereign country by a, a wicked power, which it is? Uh, that's all that needs to be said. And I said, well, actually, there is more that needs to be said. And one of the fascinating things about it is you, you, you're of similar vintage to me. I remember in the late 50s and early 60s, the constant uh, succession of, of wars, you know, whether it be Katanga or, um, or Cyprus or whatever it was, and the endless efforts being made at that time by the United Nations to intervene to bring about peace. And the huge profile of the... Secretary General of the United Nations in those times, as someone who would, who, would, who would come to try and end wars. And the fascinating thing about the, the Ukraine war is the almost total absence of any real effort both to prevent it when it was entirely foreseeable, uh, and how, once it had started, to bring it to an end. I, it, journalists will obviously cover and have to cover atrocities. Atrocities are appalling. Things and it's it's necessary that people are told that this happened in the war. I personally would 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 like this to be a little bit more recognition of the fact that there is no war in which both sides don't commit atrocities. If you don't like atrocities, then don't have wars. Uh, and it's it's absurd to imagine that that one side. Uh, the, I've I've tried to make this point. This is not Gandalf. This is not Gandalf versus the orcs. This is not a simple good versus evil. Thing. There are problems with the, the with the Ukraine, the problems of the way in which it's treated its Russian minority. There is also the the, the coverage of Ukraine now is very intense, and in some ways I'm glad to see that because it's been a neglected crisis boiling on the on the eastern horizon of our lives for a long time. But how many of the people covering it now are even aware of what happened in February 2014, uh, which was in fact a, a, a violent mob putsch against a legitimate government? Uh, which was more or less openly backed uh, by the United States. And th this, this, this introduced into, into Ukraine a, le a level of crisis, one might say, uh, from which it has yet to escape. 
but you but people don't know this stuff and in not knowing it they perhaps um, they perhaps assume that the, the the case is simpler than it is I understand what you're saying I really do but I think we would both agree that this is a very ugly situation we're in now it has the potential to do, yeah it has the potential to significantly reshape our world uh, and and not in a good way. Where do you personally think this could go? I don't think there's any limit. People lose control of wars. Yeah, I mean, you, that's what worries me. You, you'll have read Barbara Tuckman's brilliant The Guns of August and the way in which the First World War spread. I mean, I, my own belief is very strongly that Germany started the First World War, quite deliberately maneuvering Russia into mobilization. But that having happened, they hoped for a brief war involving themselves and France and Russia, which would resolve their problems. But it became a conflict which engulfed a large part of the world, um, particularly the, the, the involvement of Turkey. And this is red stain spreads across the whole mm. world with astonishing speed. And then, by about the autumn of 1915, after the Battle of Luce has been a complete disaster, everybody begins to realize that it's been a terrible mistake in which huge numbers of lives have been lost for nothing, uh, but which nobody knows how to stop. Mm. And the war continued uh, for three years after that, when the political classes of the countries involved all knew that it should come to an end because of this other terrible thing. The wars of democracies, as Churchill rightly said, are much more savage than the wars of kings because to get a democracy to go to war, you have to engender in the population such a feeling of desire for war and conflict that it's almost impossible to climb down from it. And this is the the, the great point that Huxley makes in, in, the, in the preface to, to Brave New World. The last true conservative statesman was Lord Lansdowne, who in the middle of the First World War said, wrote a letter at the Times saying, really, we ought to have a negotiated peace. And the Times wouldn't even publish it. Mm -hmm. So this is a former foreign secretary of the Conservative Party. The Times would not publish a letter from him calling for a negotiated peace because the, the level of fury had risen so high in Europe that time that no one was prepared to consider it. So we had to go on and because Lansdowne was ignored. We had the Bolshevik Revolution. And in my view, we, we had the Nazis and we had Mussolini and everything else. It could have been stopped. But the problem with wars is once they've started, you lose control of them. I mean, there's, as, as we speak, uh, there are reports coming in of what appear to be Ukrainian missile or drone attacks on Russian territory. Well, it's of course, it's perfectly reasonable for Ukraine when it's been attacked by Russia to do this. But you can see the way in which this uh, could begin to widen the war into areas which could become quite frightening. Uh, Peter, one of the things that's interested me about this conflict is that you've seen uh, almost a universality of a condemnation of Russia in the West. Um, that's in contrast to what we normally get. The left peels off from the right. So Hollywood actors where it's very woke find, suddenly find it's absolutely on board to be very critical of Russia, along with uh, you know what you would expect from the more conservative quarters. Well, I think everybody should, everybody should be critical of Russia. I think the, 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 it, it's, it's, it's in, it, it incumbent on people to condemn, it, it seems to me, the, the lawless invasion of a sovereign country. It's a disgusting thing to do, and the aggressive war is always wrong. The, the, what, what's absent is any kind of nuance in it, and there are people who condemn this very loudly, who never uttered a word, for instance, about the Saudi intervention in Yemen. Uh, who've completely forgotten, apparently, the United States and Britain uh, invaded Iraq uh, in, in 2003, uh, or that, the, um, or, or that uh, Britain and, and France particularly bombed Libya, or a large number of other things which, 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 which give, how shall I put it, some nuance to a discussion about this. And there's no, uh, almost no discussion of the, of the problems of, of Ukraine. And it's a fascinating thing here for someone like me brought up in the shadow of the Second World War. Uh, the Second World War dominated my entire childhood. It was, it was, the, it was the moral parable of my time. Uh, Peter, and, by the way. Yeah, and in this, and in this. Which makes us rare. Yeah, but it, it, it's, it, it's, it's very strong in me. And of course, it, it, what, it, one of the legacies of those that among our allies against the German Nazi menace uh, were the Soviet Union and particularly Serbia. Now, a very strange reversal in the past 30 years has seen that those countries which we regarded, for whatever their internal faults as allies, now increasingly regarded as pariah states. Mm. 
It's difficult for me, and it's part of the complete reversal of the of the politics of Europe. What in, in many ways has happened is the United States in trying to bring a and this is fascinating to me because it seems to me to be a, a part of the unexamined story of our time. The United States quite rightly has thought well, it's not going to let Europe descend into the awful, uh, the awful violence of 1939 again. Thank you very much. It's disastrous for everybody if it happens. And so the United States has helped to remake the politics of Europe, particularly by backing the creation of the European Union and the, the marriage of France and Germany, which more or less prevents conflict between them. And I'm actually quite in favor of all that. I've got no objection to it as such, though I think it's too supranational. Uh, but the, what's, what's happened in the East since the collapse of the Soviet Union has been adoption more or less of old German Policies towards the east, uh, which put the, which which mean that Serbia and and, and Russia are obstacles to um, what it's speaking of Brzezinski, uh, Jimmy Carter's Secretary of State wrote an interesting book called The Grand Chessboard, in which he discusses, for instance, the importance of Ukraine. Uh, I would have thought that if you understood the importance of Ukraine to Russia, then the last thing you'd do would be to mess around in that region unless you wanted trouble. But there has been messing around going on. But the, but the, what the fascinating thing is, is this reversal of, the, of, 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 um, of British attitudes in Europe towards countries which we previously regarded as being more or less on our side, uh, which is, uh, it, it just makes me think, which I think we all ought to do, about what, it, what actually the purpose of foreign policy is at the moment and what, it, what our aims are. But whatever they are, uh, we're playing with fire. Help me understand a little bit. Uh, I look at Zelensky and I'm inspired by his courage. I have to say that. I think this is incredible. And I wonder whether I could do it if I were in his situation. And I'm sure I couldn't. He deserves... Yeah, there's, a lot, there's a lot that's admirable but about But what's that, really there's, happening there's, there's, there? There's, Who else is influential? There's, there's a lot that's ad admirable about Zelensky. But of course, Ukraine, is, 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 it's, not, uh, it's not some paradise. It's a country more dominated by oligarchs uh, probably than Russia, and if anything, even more corrupt than Russia. Zelensky's power is limited. He was, people forget he was elected on a peace program. He said he was going to seek peace over the, because uh, war by the time he was elected had been going on for five years in the Don Basin. And, and he wanted quite rightly to end it. And he pursued the Minsk uh, talks, which, which could have ended it if Ukraine had been committed to them in my view. And he was prevented from doing so by opposition within his own armed forces. And part of that opposition, opposition came from the, the sort of Azov battalion right sector direction, which everyone now likes to pretend isn't important. But it is important. Just as the, the, the whole problem in the East and in Crimea had a lot to do with the Ukrainian state's language policy, which many Russians regarded as heavily discriminatory against them. And these, these have a lot to do with the mess that we're now in. Have you been surprised? Uh, oh no, sorry, let me backtrack for a moment. One of the things that worries me about this, and it might seem so here, sitting talking to you in Oxford, but back home I'm actually a farmer and a grain producer. Australia is the sixth largest exporter of grain, a major exporter of other proteins mm. and what have you. The Ukraine will be off the radar as it was back in the communist days when it was hopelessly unproductive. I mean, it had been once the breadbasket of yeah. Europe, then immobilised the horrendous things that happened there that crippled its economy, its agriculture sector. That's disastrous. Before this, it was the fifth largest exporter of grain, a lot of it going to Africa. Food security and pricing, people's ability to buy it when they're not well off, may be severely impacted well, this is, this is, this is, this is, as a worldwide... This is, this is, Aspect there are so many reasons to avoid war. Yeah. The horror of it, I and mean, once you've seen a human head after a bullet has passed through it, you're never again going to think that there's anything glorious about war, uh, or, and you're going to think, well, if it can possibly be avoided, then it should be, and if it can possibly be brought to an end, then people say, well, you'll have to make compromises. Of course you have to make compromises. That's the price of not having people uh, standing in the street weeping with a dead child in their arms and their home in flames. If you don't want that, then you have to compromise to make peace. But there's no effort for that. And here, we, and the, you're right, the economic consequences of this war for poor people around the world are going to be terrible, as well as the, 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 the personal consequences for people in Ukraine, who in many cases have no stake whatsoever in, in having a war of any kind, but their, their homes have still been demolished. 
uh, their, their, their relatives may have been murdered or tortured or carted off. We don't know. Horrible things happen to both sides at the hands of both sides in war. And they, they go on and on and on unless somebody has the guts to stop it. And I continue to say, why is there not more pressure for this to end? Well, then, to, to start to segue into uh, the broader debate to include China, do you think the reaction, there would have been genuine surprise in Russia and, for that matter, Beijing, at the way most of the world has responded? Uh, you've had American leadership, you've had surprising responses from Germany, although I don't know whether they'll follow through, mm -hmm. and from NATO. Uh, and, and, and the response is not something I would have foreseen, and it's... Well, what would what, do you, what would you, what would you not have foreseen? To uh, find what it is you would not, because I'm not sure. I would have thought they, that, that there would have been a greater reluctance to supply arms, more particularly uh, that they that you wouldn't have seen pretty widespread sanctions, even though it appears, for example, that Germany's effectively funding the war effort at the same time as they're putting some arms into the Ukraine. They're paying a lot of money on a daily basis for resources out of Russia. Well, I think they'd have an economic collapse if they didn't, because you, without energy, their economy would stop functioning. Mm -hmm. But uh, the, the, that's, there is a great complexity in the German-Russian relationship, which nobody should need to be surprised by. I don't know. I mean, I think people feel at the moment safe that as long as they don't actively enter the war with, um, with the open deployment of troops, uh, that it won't widen. I, I take the I'm point. not sure that they're right. Well, they've got theatre war, uh, nuclear war bombs, haven't they? I mean, oh, a lot yeah. of them. The West I, has hardly any. We don't know about that. But those. I like to think that the nuclear um, option is... Um, and I think, I think my own view is that Putin went to some extent off his head when he decided to invade. I don't think he's mad in the sense that he's smearing his own excrement on his bedroom walls or anything like that. But I think that he, he, he has lost touch with reality to some extent. But I don't think he's lost touch with reality to the extent that he, he doesn't know that going nuclear would be a, a, a suicidal act. I, I live in hope that that's so, because if he if he hasn't if he doesn't still make that distinction, then we probably all are finished. You know, you hear this talk that they've got these much smaller nuclear bombs that nobody's really focused on that could take out a town or a village. Well, you, you, it's you, not the same as saying, you know, if we attack New York and bomb it out, then Moscow. Yeah, gone. but it's true. But I mean, modern conventional weapons are, are tremendously powerful as well. Yeah, and can do at that, that. at that level. Can do. There's not. I wouldn't have thought there was any would it be any military justification in using nuclear weapons when you could when you have ex the extraordinarily powerful conventional ones which we possess anyway, it's a political step. Once you've used a nuclear weapon, you, again, you have no idea when the, when the process will stop. And I, almost any, any sane political leader, however nasty he may be, must realise that. Well, we certainly hope so. We have to hope so. <laughs> yes, we do. Uh, but I, I, as I say, I think that he has, he has lost touch with reality, but I don't think he's lost touch with reality to that extent. And if I'm wrong, well, there won't really be much point in having many discussions about it, will there? No, there won't, tragically. Now, now to pivot to Beijing, how do you think they'd see all of this? they become very close. The Prime Minister of Australia talks about the emerging arc of autocracy. It's not a bad term in a way, it seems to me. It's a bit um, like the axis of evil, isn't it? <laughs> well, nonetheless, <laughs> it underlines that this is really serious. And we've seen them, you know, the, the two countries draw very close, no better friends, and all the rest of them. Right. I, let's not exaggerate this. I mean, the, the, the fundamental relationship between, between Russia and China is one of hostility over the, 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 the territory seized by the Russian Empire from China mm. uh, under unfair treaties, as the Chinese view it, so, centuries ago, and they want it back. My enemy's friends are mine. Well, I don't think there's any great... And also, it, it, China is immensely more economically and uh, diplomatically powerful than, than Russia. Russia can only be a client of China's. So I don't, I don't, I don't think that the, the, the Chinese would see particularly uh, any political desire to help Russia because they're a fellow despotism. I think uh, it's, in fact, Russia still just about has some remaining forms of democracy and free speech, so they're rapidly disappearing, and is in many important ways a very different sort of society from China, but. I would have thought there are some conveniences, and particularly uh, China has always been short of energy. Uh, there are some conveniences in the relationship, but I wouldn't go much further than that. I would, 
And also, I don't think that if Taiwan put in an application for NATO membership, it would be favorably considered. <laughs> well, that's right. But you, to come back to something. In fact, perhaps they should try and see what happens, because it would be an <laughs> interesting illustration of just how far this, uh, this, this supposed shield would be extended and how principled it really is. Um, to come back to something you said, touched on earlier, it's very interesting the contrasting way in which we condemn Russia for every ill, mm. serious, and imagined, and yet we let China off. Perhaps you know the answer is in what you just said. They're diplomatically and economically much more powerful. Yeah. But you stop and think about it. There's there's the barbarity that it displays towards its own citizens uh, and 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 to its non citizens that it claims as theirs oh. in various satellite states. You've got the South China Sea. Where the Chinese endlessly lecture us on international norms oh, in no, Australia. So the, 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 the blatantly racialist imperialism going on in Xinjiang towards the Uyghurs is just is astonishing. Mm. Uh, so we turn ourselves inside out looking for racism is, in our culture. We, we, you know, we look back at the history of the, of, of the, of the European empires and the horrible things that they often did. Uh, and, and we make a great uh, fuss about it, and quite rightly so. And we must remember these things so as we don't do them again when China does what it's doing to the Uyghurs. Uh, there is a sort of, oh, well, this is terrible, uh, paper condemnation, but no real change in attitudes. To me, all this is, um, it, it, so much of this outrage is, is, is ultimately phony because it's not consistent. If you hate uh, aggressive war, then you hate it whoever does it, and you condemn whoever does it. Uh, and you know, we, if you hate despotism, then you hate it everywhere. So it really isn't much of a thing, is it? If Germany switches its its, uh, its main supply of fuel from the Russian despotism to the Saudi despotism. But we make out that it's a difference. I don't quite know why. Uh, I, there's, there's, a, there's a lack of true principle in so much of this, which, 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 which makes me feel faintly ill. And we, uh, the, the number of regimes which the West props up, supports, or, or refuses to criticize with the Sisi's military dictatorship in Egypt, which again massacred its own people in, blatantly in Cairo, or particularly the Saudi state, which, which murders its opponents and actually cuts them up into pieces in its own consulates. Uh, if, we, if we really are, if, if we really have this, these, these, um, these feelings of revulsion as a matter of principle, then we have to express them in all occasions. And again, with with I read you know, the terrible story of this, this this family in Odessa, destroyed the other day by a, a, a Russian missile, and it, it, it makes you weep. But how many people are aware of what happened when British and French jets bombed Libya? I and mean, there were horrible things happened then, which were, were reported lightly in the rest of the press. If you if you hate these things, you hate them wherever they are. You mustn't just use them as a way of, of, of working yourself up into a, into a frenzy about a particular political objective you may have now. You have to hate them universally. It does seem to me that, you know, we've been talking about how the West did not help Russia when it sought to democratise. Very different in the case of China, where there was a view, perhaps naive, perhaps driven by self-interest, perhaps even by greed, but there was a view that if we traded, if we recognised, traded, worked with them, as their living standards rose, as they felt more secure in themselves, they would liberalise. Yeah. Whereas in reality, we know now that we took our eyes off the ball, forgot, if you like, the real nature of communism. So it's not, we're not talking about the Chinese people here, we're talking about- I remember about going to Shanghai for the first time, must be about coming up to 20 years ago now, and being terrified because here was the absolute proof that the theory that if you give a man a Mercedes, he'll become a Democrat, it's not true. Here was this city of immense uh, modern prosperity and, uh, and, and capitalist growth, and to get rich was glorious. But there wasn't the faintest trace of freedom of the press or freedom of thought or expression uh, of democratic governance or of the rule of law. It was a secret police tyranny, and yet it was prosperous. And that, that idea died with amazing speed. But although it died, I didn't see anybody much making any sense of the fact that it wasn't true. The, the, the willingness to accept that China was there and that was pretty much beyond criticism, that we would hand Hong Kong over to it, that when China broke its agreements blatantly about, uh, about even leaving Hong Kong free for 50 years, we wouldn't do anything, which we didn't. Do you know what I mean? I mean it's just, it, it, if, if, you, if, it's, if it's a principle, it's a principle. It applies everywhere. 
If it's not a principle, then what is it? Mm. I mean, in, in a sense, I think what you're referring back to is that freedom only works when we genuinely respect every other human being properly. And that was really the, you know, the great experiment in democracy. Well, Russia, that created the... I, think Russia, I think Russia was open uh, in 1991. I think Russia was open to the ideas of yeah. freedom. Yeah. I think it, the, the, the great tragedy of 1917, uh, the suppression of the Constituent Assembly, is too little known about. Yeah. Uh, that the, the there is there's still an idea that the, the, the ridiculous Eisenstein propaganda film of, of October 1917, in which the revolution is portrayed as a mass uprising and the storming of the Winter Palace, is still widely believed as a complete lie. Well, of course it is. I mean, uh, but the, the, but what what had happened was, as I say, an extraordinarily well conducted election over the whole vast mass of Russia in the middle of a very bitter war after the Tsar had been overthrown. A successfully elected a constituent assembly, which just didn't happen to have enough Bolsheviks in it for Lenin to be pleased. So he shut it down. Uh, he, he destroyed the first meeting by planting clacks in it. And he shut it down with the bayonets of Kronstadt sailors. And it was killed. And, but Russia was quite capable. The idea it was too backward to cope uh, with the idea of liberal democracy is false. Uh, Russia had in it in 1917 a democratic spirit, which could, in my view, have been revived. I take the point. I mean, one of the things that I think I learned in a long time in public office is that often the people out the back there whom the elites regard as unable to make wise decisions about their own future. It's not actually right. Well, I did, but there's this, there is this Russophobia, and I speak very strongly against Russophobia because I used to suffer from it. When I went to Russia in 1992 to, to, to live, I, to, to, I'd been there a few times before, I was deeply prejudiced against against Russians and Russia as a, what I regarded as a squalid and backward and, and unforgivably brutal society. And I learned very quickly in contact with Russians that this was, I had, a, I had a relapse because in January 1991, I was in Vilnius when the KGB actually opened fire on, 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 on crowds of, 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 of protesters completely without justification. It was one of the worst things I'd ever seen in my life. And I came back to Moscow almost unable to speak to any Russians I knew. But I realized after a while this wasn't a Russian thing. This was this this had been a, a, a spasm of the what would now be called the deep state. Uh, and the many Russians found it as despicable as I did. But it it, it, it was an easy thing to fall back into because I'd held it for so much of my life. As a cold warrior, it was easy both to be against communism and to despise Russia. But I got over it and I I, was, I had this extraordinary opportunity in my life to see a moment of genuine history happening. Not so many things are described as historic these days, and they're not. But here was the overthrow of, a, of one of the worst tyrannies in the, that's ever been seen in the world. I saw it. And f from those to whom much is given, much is required. And therefore, I feel a duty to tell people, you've got this wrong. You misunderstand the nature of, of Russia and its people. And by doing so, you, you bring upon yourselves uh, things which you, you don't need to suffer. Can we just tease out a little bit, uh, you know, so you're saying we must be careful about the, how we really see the Russian people. I mean, my starting point would be in the end, we have a shared humanity. We're all, as yeah. Solzhenitsyn had it, we're all a mixture. None of us can claim to the high moral ground. None of us are so completely depraved. I don't believe that we're not part of the human family. But in many ways, I wonder whether the Western view of Russia wasn't coloured by... You think of the fall of Berlin, Anthony Beaver, the way in which people almost lived in absolute terror of being caught by the Russian soldiers because they were so cruel. Has that coloured our view a bit? And, 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 and would you argue that that's not to fully understand the Russian? No, no, I think, I think um, terrible things were done by the Soviets, and I must stress Soviet rather than, than, than Russian armies, uh, which cannot be excused. Uh, nor well excuse, but again, you can sort of explain them by the the immense cruelty of the of, of the war waged on Russia by the German invaders in 1941. Afterwards, it wasn't they didn't just arrive and, uh, and and put a flag over the town hall and say you're now ruled by Germans. It was a, it was a war almost immediately of extermination and murder, and anybody who resisted it was put down with the most extraordinary fury. And huge numbers of people died in, in, in filthy circumstances as a result. It was a very, very cruel war, also in which the Geneva 
conventions were not applied to the prisoners who were taken. It was, a, it was an utterly barbaric experience from start to finish and an extraordinary cruel. I wouldn't seek to excuse it, uh, but it was, um, it was, there's a, there has to be an understanding here that 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 that, that it was it was it, it was terrible on both sides and beyond restraint. It was also, and this is the problem we have to face in Britain. It was for most of the period. It was the war. This is where the this is where the Germans were being killed and driven back. Now we until 1944 we were not involved in it, apart from in the, in the, the um, it, it, Italian campaigns, which weren't central to it, it was the war. And modern war is horrible. Yes. Uh, yeah, excuse, I, what, what we would have done, I, I often say that the, the problem for both British and American people studying history is that we, in Britain we live surrounded by a large quantity of deep, quite rough salt water which is worth who knows how many divisions uh, in, 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 of infantry, uh, cavalry, and artillery. And the United States has the Pacific Ocean on one side, the Atlantic Ocean on the other, Canada on top, and Mexico underneath. And most of the nations of Europe do not have these luxuries, and as a result, their, their histories and indeed their presence are pretty bitter. But if we want again to, to, to be concerned about the horrors of the of the Russian conduct, the Soviet conduct of the of, of the war in Germany, we also ought to examine our the, the things we gave permission for under the Potsdam Agreement for the, um, the, the the gigantic scale of savage ethnic cleansing of largely of women and children uh, out of Central Europe, which took place in the years after 1945, mm -hmm. uh, which was uh, studied in in an excellent but horrifying book called Orderly and Humane, which I recommend to anybody. Who wants to feel smug about the Second World War? Which leads me to, if I may pivot now, to another area that you've written a lot about. A lot of what we've been saying is people ought to know what has really happened. In other words, history. Yes. If you're to draw the right lessons out of it, and if you're to avoid making the worst mistakes, um, that comes to education. Uh, and it seems to me that if history is taught at all, it's often taught very badly, but it's not just history. You've recently completed a book on the shutting down of the grammar schools in England and the consequences for British education of that decision. Um, what exactly were, because I've never fully... Well, the term, is the, the, the term in England is, 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 is specific. I mean, in, in the United States, it means something completely different. For instance, it's a, it's a sort of infant school. The grammar schools were, uh, and they, they existed in this form, from about 1944 to about uh, 1970. Uh, they were state schools, as they run largely by local authorities, uh, which, were, um, which were selective on the basis of, of academic ability, and they selected at the age of 11, which meant that it didn't matter how poor you were, you could get, uh, if you showed yourself to be able to benefit from it, you could get a superb uh, secondary education, very rigorous. Uh, and the, they became politically unpopular because they became quite hard to get into for reasons. I, mean, I could fundamentally there was a huge baby bulge after the Second World War, which increased the the, the pressure on places there, and so people and the, they didn't increase the number of schools to cope with this, and so people began to find that their children were being rejected for ground schools when they thought they should get in. And the feeling of injustice made them politically unpopular, and so they were got rid of. That's the simplest, the simplest version of the story. I've often said that in in the modern world, people are, are, are taught what to think rather than how to think. I think the uh, part of the idea of those who wanted to get rid of the grammar schools, because there was a big egalitarian campaign to get rid of them, which succeeded, was that they wanted, uh, particularly a man called Graham Savage, to recreate in Britain the American high school system. And the American high school is very interesting. They're really a socialization enterprise. They're basically to, to, designed to create Americans. Uh, education in America starts at college uh, when you've finished high school. And what we now have in this country is a system of high schools in which people are socialized. And what are they socialized in? They're socialized in what you might call the modern ideology. But the, one of the things about grammar schools, as they were, a few vestigial ones exist, but they're not really what they used to be was that they were incredibly rigorous about the teaching of knowledge. And when people say, well, how would you, if you want people taught how to think, 
how would you do that? I said, well, fundamentally, you start with the knowledge. So if you're learning a language, you'll get nowhere unless you learn the grammar and the vocabulary, the hard, horrible slog of those things are the only way you will ever successfully learn a language unless you learn it as a child uh, from, from listening. And the same with the sciences, the hard sciences, and with history. If you don't know, then you can't begin to think. If you don't know, you can't, you can't question what people tell you and say, well, then shall I actually find out if the basis of this is so? And I think by destroying the grammar schools, we destroyed rigor in schools uh, to such an extent that it's very rare now to find people who have the, 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 the basis of knowledge which enables them to understand, to criticize their own positions and, and those of others and to think. We, 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 this is missing from our society. We now have an almost, for instance, on so many subjects, an almost totally unanimous parliament. We have an almost totally unanimous civil service. We have an almost, almost totally unanimous teaching profession. We have an almost totally unanimous media on almost all major subjects. That should not be. In a thinking society, there should be dissent, and it should be respected. Now, I find myself, to my total astonishment, a, 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 a dissenter on, on several major subjects now. And what I notice is that the response to dissent is increasingly hostility. Why don't you shut up? Uh, the accusations that I'm a war crimes denier, uh, people openly accuse me of being in the pay of the Russian government, all kinds of bilge, anything but rational arguments saying, okay, let's discuss this, what's your point? I don't get that at all, really. And I think that's a result of having a society which is fundamentally ignorant and therefore af afraid of knowledge which it has not been told is true. And an inability, perhaps, to push back on the basis of facts. So facts become... Well, but not, but not, not Wokeism even, collapses not even it hits facts. Interested. Yeah. yeah. Not even taught to value them, not even not having had that amazing discovery. You read the book, the footnote says... This, you, you trace the footnote, you find the origin. I never knew that. Mm. And this is one of the great joys of life, is the discovery of things you didn't know. But most people are protected against it because their minds are closed by, by the, the security of the ideology in which they live. And if ever it's challenged, then everyone gathers around and shouts at the person who challenges it. And they're not compelled to go, go and look at the footnotes. So they never find out. So you talked, you used the term, I think, uh, that the schools basically now are an exercise in socialising people according I, to... I what's... believe increasingly yeah. so. It's very hard. I mean, I, I have to say this is, a, this is conjecture, uh, what they call stochastic, I believe, in, 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 in modern pseudoscience. It's guesswork, because you cannot get inside these places. How would you actually go and examine the workings of a modern British state school? if you got permission to go and observe what was going on, would you see what was normally going on or would it be prepared for you? If you could get permission at all. I know there were, this is a different subject slightly, but a, a, a couple of, of teachers a few years ago cooperated with a television company and secretly filmed what was going on in their classrooms, which was in many cases disorder. And they were actually condemned by the teaching profession for doing this. <laughs> wow. Um, You've been critical of the 2010 Equality Act in this country. Uh, it was supposed to, and desirable, uh, to remove discrimination against people in the workplace, um, but it was you know, around the uh, characteristics, age, disability, gender reassignment, race, sexual orientation, amongst others. And do you warn that it might see the emergence of a sort of soft totalitarianism, not jackboots, but a oh, no. sort of soft... Um, yeah, we had this, uh, it had quite a bit of publicity in Australia, the sacking of a member of staff at Eton uh, because he showed a, a video critiquing feminism. Yeah. Uh, and he was accused by another staff member of breaching that very Equality Act. Do you see that, those predictions I, I, of I, I, soft totalitarianism I, I wouldn't coming want, through? I wouldn't want that case. Uh, I, 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 I'd say I wouldn't particularly want to rely on that case as being the one on which I made my point. Uh, it's, it more often shows itself in that what, it, what the Equality Act did was it finally and specifically and explicitly replaced the idea that this country was based upon Christianity with the idea that equality and diversity were the principal things which had to be observed and pursued. And the, the, the effect of this, particularly on how religious belief is treated, is fascinating. Previously, uh, Christianity being 
the effect, effectively the official religion of the country uh, by which the, the monarch is crowned and is supposedly written into what, the, what our constitution actually is, would have been considered to be a, 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 a religion which, which didn't need to be defended, uh, whose practice didn't need to be uh, particularly given uh, any privilege because they already existed. Now, under equality and diversity, Christianity is treated on exactly the same level as any of the other religions. Islam, Hinduism, Jainism, Buddhism, whatever you, whatever you get, it's, it's just one religion. And that, to me, was an enormous revolution in the nature of the country. Because equality and diversity as, a, as an ideology, like human rights, uh, seems to me to have so many subjective areas. Who are the protected categories which equality and diversity will protect? And which are the ones which it won't? In other words, uh, and, and it in, in human rights, where, is a con where there is a conflict between, say, the right to privacy and the right to free press, who decides which uh, mm. actually uh, which which actually wins? Uh, and and you, you you retreat very rapidly into subjective positions in which the in which you give uh, judges who are increasingly people educated in the modern ideology enormous power to rule on how things should be done. It's a revolution. And undoubtedly, those who, who continue to believe that they should act as they did before will run up against it. And if they run up against it, they'll usually do so in place of work. And if they continue to be difficult about it, then their employment is, is in danger. And of course, this is nothing like Amnesty International is never going to get people to start letter writing about people who lose their jobs. Uh, anybody can see that people being thrown into prison for their, or tortured for their political views. They need to be defended. But the quiet pressure Look, if, you, if you'll only be quiet, it'll be all right. But if you carry on making this fuss, then I'm afraid you'll have to go. Uh, is, this is what I call the soft totalitarianism. It's not that soft when it affects you personally. It just appears to be soft. But it creates a unanimity of opinion and a lack of dissent and a, a, a general crushing of freedom that is, uh, is quite dangerous to a society which actually can't really function without free criticism. It's an interesting thing that polling in both America I think, and certainly in Australia, has now been, the art of polling has become much more difficult because a lot of people won't tell you what they honestly believe and think and what they intend doing in the ballot box for fear of offending the thought police that also they are working. Yeah, people are increasingly not sure that, that, that this stuff will remain confidential either. Yeah, well, that's right. Yeah, that their name won't end up on a list somewhere. Yeah, well, if it's, once it's gone into an electronic database, who knows where it might end up. And it's not, it, is it an unreasonable fear? I don't know. I, you can the fact that it's there amongst you know, thinking citizens yeah, tells you that tells you that there's something a quite important. Isn't they it? shouldn't be worried about it. Yeah, but you can't. But you can't. It's um, it's too disparate and 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 soft and indirect. Uh, it's the this is this is how, how did people think uh, that the Enlightenment would come to an end? Uh, possibly by you know, the, the great the, you know, the boot stamping on a human face forever, but in fact, it, it, it comes softly, gently, slowly, uh, almost kindly. And then after 20 or 30 years of it, uh, there is no real freedom of speech or thought. So, so Peter, you've been generous with your time to bring the ship into dock, so to speak. There are those who would say that your prognosis for Western society and for the advancement of civilization more generally is, is too negative. Well, I hope they're right. <laughs> I, I really hope they're right. Well. Um, they, they but, I think, but I actually think they're wrong. I, I, I'm afraid it's very, it's, it's, it's even worse. Right? No. Well, let me, let me uh, just run this by, idea by you. There are those, I, I've run across you know, highly intelligent people in Australia who would agree with your analysis, but say, hang on, let's not un overlook the possibility and the importance of trying to do what the, if you like, the monasteries did in the middle. Uh, the Benedict option. Yeah, rather, well, rather. not only that, keeping alive the learning the commitment to freedom, the sort of concepts that have undergirded our way of life uh, and trying to make certain... But how do you do that? Well, that's that's the question. Are there ways, you know, they're starting uh, new you... institutions, they're fighting the decay, which you've been doing, and you've become, I think, if you don't mind me saying so, at times uh, you get a bit frustrated that people won't listen, but people are trying it. They want to have a go. Well, good luck to them. I'm not against people trying. Uh. Uh, I'm not even going to say I think they will fail, but I, at the moment it looks pretty dark to me. And one of the worst things about it is the lack of alarm. Yeah, uh, I, I find that in Australia today, the lack of urgency to address some of these issues is deeply concerning. But Peter, again, 
I've thoroughly enjoyed our interaction, uh, your sparkling mind and engagement. And what comes through in the end, I'm going to say this, is a deep sense of humanity. You might feel at times you're pushing back against people who you disagree with, but actually what comes through, Peter, is a deep sense of concern that people might enjoy freedom and respect and dignity. And I salute you for that. Well, it's nice you say so, but I'm I'm really hoping hoping to transmit uh, the Christian religion in which I profoundly believe. The dangerous idea. The dangerous idea, the most dangerous idea of all. For the reasons that it that it transforms us. Well, no, that it transforms us. If it, if if we know that this is an, an ordered, purposeful universe whose aim is justice, then both we have something to hope for, and we also have a duty a very strong duty to seek it. In a famous moment in the closing session of a Dangerous Ideas Festival in Australia, you said, uh, you were asked, why is it dangerous? And I think you said something, because people will then pursue justice and yeah, mercy yeah. and hope. And I thought that was uh, one of the most uh, unbelievable rejoinders I've ever heard. Well, so, it's kind of, so the whole thing was a total surprise to me. I only discovered about eight hours before I was going to be on the program. And then the that particular question came out of the blue as well. So I don't know how that happened, really. Well, it was a brilliant bit of batsmanship. And I thank you for your time today. Well, thank you very much for having me. Thank you.